We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Swain and the North Oak Band. Let me invite you to turn in the Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to read just verses 14 and 15, and verse 15 will be the focus of our time here together today. Um, to those of you who are first-time residential students with the spring semester 2023, let me say on behalf of our president, Jason Allen, welcome to you. We're so glad that you've come here to Kansas City to study with us. And if you feel like you're jumping in on a train that's already moving because you're coming at the middle of the academic year, that's perfectly normal and okay. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, welcome to our, our family and our time of study. So we're so glad to have each and every one of you. First Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and then 15. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. For a number of years, I think going back to January 2017, I've given messages like this at this time of year in chapel related to some of the most important lessons I learned during the years when I sat where you sit, uh, not the faculty, I'm talking about the students. Uh, at the beginning, I talked about the most important doctrine I learned whilst I was a student. Uh, building from Hebrews 2, I talked about the central and vital role of the doctrine of propitiation and the atonement, um, my coming to understand that, the role it played and plays in my life. Uh, the next year, I talked about the most important discipline I learned while I was a student, looking at Ephesians 2, talked about conquering pride and sin by remembering and reminding uh, is one of the most life-giving experiences that one can have in the Christian life. The following year, I talked about the most important discovery that I learned, building from 1 Corinthians 10, and I talked about loving, loving and treasuring the Old Testament as a means of loving and treasuring reading the entire Bible. Then I talked about the most important diagnosis that I learned whilst I was a student. Looking at 1 Samuel 16, I aim to show that there's no value in what you believe unless it leads to love. And then last time I talked about the most important directive that I learned whilst I was a student looking at Galatians 3 and talked about the importance of keeping the grand end in view for the blessing of the nations through missions. So this year I'm back uh, following a similar pattern with today talking about the most important decision I made whilst I was a student. This decision that I made has proved to serve as biblical guardrails to guide and inform every other ministry and life decision that I've made since that time. It was a simple decision. It wasn't monumentous in the sense of no one has ever made that decision before. It wasn't a new idea. It wasn't a novel idea, but it proved to be incredibly foundational. Basically, the lens through which I make every decision. So whilst I was a student, while I sat where you sit, I learned the importance of the decision to live for the church. No matter my vocation, no matter my location, no matter my specific ministry assignment, no matter my part-time job, no matter my full-time job, no matter how many classes I was taking, no matter how much money or how little money I had, I made the decision that I was going to live for the church. And as the Bible guides us, I'm convinced that all Christians should make that decision as well, should prioritize living for the church. So today, using 1 Timothy 3 and many other passages, <coughs> I want to explain. So let me begin here. There's a culprit 
out there in evangelicalism and in among church life with believing Christians called indifference. Indifference. And this idea of indifference lies at the, the root of many of the difficulties present throughout the Christian world today. If you have to boil down most causes of problems, it's really this idea of indifference. Believers acting under various constructs from Protestant liberalism to ecumenism to even conservative evangelicalism engage in difference, especially when it comes to the role and value of the church. What exists today, largely within evangelicalism, is a climate, if you will, of ecclesiological relativism. Indifference abounds toward doctrines of the church that many claim are biblically ambiguous. The Bible doesn't say enough about that, so I don't think we really need to think about that. There are clearly more doctrines that are important. But the result of this lack of emphasis on the local church has been, over decades, impure and unhealthy churches that more often than not self-destruct from either internal disputes or doctrinal deterioration then they are compromised from some sort of outside attack from the world. In short, churches themselves often don't have a good answer for why believers should attend and join their church on a regular basis. And of course, as many of us know, COVID gave many attenders a reason never even to come back at all. As a result, the testimonies of these unhealthy churches are lost in their communities, and the gospel is often carried by individuals independent of local churches rather than by the churches themselves. However, when healthy churches live out the designs for the local church found in the Bible, the church then begins to fulfill its God-designed purpose and thrives. But another way, when churches have a healthy understanding of their own doctrine of the church, that's the key to them thriving and prospering. So when I say that as a student, I decided to live for the church, I mean I made an intentional commitment to prioritize and focus on the local church as God's designed vehicle to protect and deliver the gospel to future generations and to the ends of the earth. There's a lot in that definition. Don't worry, you'll hear it about eight more times before we're done. So to show you what I mean here, what it means to live, to decide to live for the church, I want to look at 1 Timothy 3.15 as our foundational text. And as I say, we'll build off of that and a number of the texts as well. And I'm going to do it by asking and answering three questions. Question number one, where does the church fit? Question number two, why does the church exist? Question number three, what is the church's purpose? Where does the church fit will be the longest amount of our time. So once we get through that, you'll look at your watch and say, how much longer is this going to go? And don't worry, the last two compress a little bit. But we have to lay this foundation of understanding where does the church fit? So question number one, where does the church fit? The brief answer that I'll get to is this. Like the moon in the sky, the church shines because of the sun. The moon shines because of the physical sun. The church shines because of the Son of God. Where does the church fit? Like the moon in the sky, it shines because of the sun. What I mean here is, how should we think about the church in relationship to other doctrines? Or how does living for the church relate to living for the gospel or living for the nations or living for the glory of God? Is that somehow in competition with those seemingly greater things to be prioritizing? For as we read and study the Bible, we realize that some doctrines clearly are more significant than others, not in terms of truthfulness or ultimate value, but definitely in terms of priority. In 2005, our Albert Moeller Jr. provided a word of great clarity to his audience with an article called A Call for Theological Triage and Christian Maturity. And in this article, he explains that this, he says, in recent years, emergency medical personnel have practiced a discipline known as triage. And if any of you have ever been to the emergency room, and I have more times than I would like to admit, it's in the dozens. Um, I don't know if that means I'm accident prone or what, but I have been a number of times. In emergency room, they practice a discipline known as triage, a process that allows trained personnel to make a quick evaluation of, relative, of a relative medical emergency. So given the chaos of an emergency room uh, reception area, someone must be armed, Moeller says, with the medical expertise to make an immediate determination of medical priority, which patients should be rushed into surgery, which patients can wait for a less urgent examination. Moeller takes this idea of medical triage and then unveils a method for triaging doctrines in three levels. He calls them first-order doctrines, which are 
Fundamental truths of the Christian faith, non-negotiable, clearly the highest priority. He then identifies second order doctrines where doctrines that represent areas where Christians may disagree, but, and even with division, uh, but not necessarily fracturing. You're not talking about a new faith here. And then third order doctrines, areas where believing Christians may disagree, but yet remain in fellowship, clearly more minor doctrines. So theological triage from 2005 forward, it became something that people talk about often, and it's often a handy tool for thinking through debates within and without the church and things like this. Another even simpler way, which is actually older than triage, is the way Christians throughout church history have thought through these things, is, is to think in terms of theological triage as it relates to the church, is to classify these doctrines really into two categories, into internal commands and external commands. So the simpler way, if you follow me here, I'm sort of triaging the triage even further down to say that there's actually a better way, which is internal and external commands of Christ. Follow with me here. The internal are the more crucial doctrines to the Christian faith as they relate to individuals, their souls, their relationship to their creator. However, any primacy given to these internal doctrines does not mean that the external doctrines have little value or lack importance. So let me give you a few examples of how we see both working together in the Bible. Look, if you will, or just recall the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. In the Great Commission, first, Jesus exhorts the disciples to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This mandate speaks of the internal act that must happen by the Holy Spirit and regenerating new believers to make them a disciple. And it produces, by result, a fruit-bearing disciple. So here, the internal aspects of these commands come first, even the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples. The most prominent thing in the Great Commission is the sharing of the gospel and seeing the Holy Spirit work and making disciples, responding to these internal commands to repent and believe. And we see this being primary because, for example, when one of the criminals crucified along Jesus asked Jesus in faith, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In this exchange, Jesus' affirmation came in response to the, the other criminal's outward expression of the internal work of what was going on in his heart by the Holy Spirit. So due to the nature of the circumstances, they're both hanging on crosses. Discussion of the rest of the Great Commission, the external commands found in the Bible related to baptism or church order or participation in the Lord's Supper or or anything like this were not as important as the criminal's life after death. There's even a triaging happening there. He didn't have to get down to be baptized in order to be saved. It doesn't mean baptism is not important. It's just clearly the internal command is of primacy, prime importance. So this is not to say that these external commands have no importance, as I'm saying, but rather simply they're less important then the internal commands that address the question, Luke 10, 25, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That internal command is primary. The gospel is primary, to put it another way. Another example, when Paul writes his phenomenal chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection, he reminds the believers what he delivered to them what? First. And that thing that he delivered to them first was the gospel, namely that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul clearly wrote to the Corinthians about many other vital items of an external nature for the local church, chapters of instructions for what they should do and how they should live, how they should carry out the Christian life, things that they needed in order to thrive and survive. But those were not the things that he wrote of first importance. The first instructions he related to the Corinthians were of an internal, a more important nature. This primacy of the internal teachings of Christianity appear in Paul's letter to the Galatians as well. He expressed his concern for believers who were deserting the faith and did not revolve around their quibbling over external teachings. Paul intervenes as a result of their, in, into their quibbling and says, simply, if you're entertaining a different gospel that's different from the teaching of the internal nature that you believed and put in Jesus, you are accursed. You, you are put out. This term accursed to reserve in reaction to not believing that internal command. He doesn't employ the term commerce, cursed when he talks about other things that are dividing them. External matters, baptism, church discipline, things like that in the Corinthian church, for example. So clearly, the first commands churches should carry forth is the internal command of the gospel in obedience to the Great Commission. That is the reconciliation of 
lost and rebellious men and women like you and me, to a holy and wise and perfect God comes only through faith expressed in the work of God's Son bearing the punishment on behalf of humanity. That is first, it is central, and it should always be. The doctrine of the church comes second to that. And the reason why stressing this is so important is because all throughout church history, churches have sometimes inverted these. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, in their core doctrines, that's essentially what's happening. You're elevating the doctrine of the church even over the doctrine of the gospel. So to live for the church, the decision I made when I was a student means that the gospel comes first and it remains central. However, if we return to the, back to the Great Commission, we see that right after that internal command to make disciples, Jesus does what? He instructs his disciples to baptize the new disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And here the command to baptize marks an external component in the Great Commission. You're to obey something externally. You're to do something in response to what's happened to you inside. The external commands are not as important. They do not correctly, directly convey the power to make one wise for salvation, but they are vital for healthy Christian living. They're vital also for preserving that internal message for future generations and for the nations, and therefore shouldn't be discarded. And that's the the relationship I want to unpack for you to begin to see that clearly the gospel is central. Clearly the gospel is of first priority. But the external commands, especially given to the doctrine of the church, are vital for ensuring that that gospel message perseveres, that it is transmitted, that it is carried. The biblically designed vehicle that God has given to protect the gospel and deliver it to next generation and to the ends of the earth is what? The local church. I'll give two more illustrations. Remember, I said this was the longer section before we get to the other ones, because I think it's so important to see this coming out from Scripture itself. The book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. When Peter, we see in Acts 2, lifts up his voice and addresses the mocking and perplexing crowd who did not know how to make sense of the arrival of the Holy Spirit, he proclaims, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In response to Peter's wielding Old Testament text as sharp two-edged sword. The crowd, in response to this, was cut to the heart. And they said, well, what shall we do? And Peter responded with the first primary internal command to do what? Repent. Signaling the need for both confession of sin and faith expressed in belief. Peter's entrance into his proclamation ministry follows the example of Jesus himself, who began his ministry saying what? The internal command. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1.15. But Peter continues in Acts 2, however, and quickly articulates that the external command for here is to be baptized, Acts 2.38, thus practicing the entire Great Commission with both the internal command first and then the external commands second. So as with the Great Commission, the order prescribed by Peter, first internal, then external, shows the importance of one over the other, clearly, gospel first. Baptism doesn't save. He's not saying, go and be baptized and then believe. And some traditions throughout church history have gotten those things upside down as well. Saying, no, gospel first, then be baptized, internal, then external. But it doesn't, so it doesn't negate the essential function of both types of the commands. So to have eternal life, the soon-to-be disciple must repent and believe, internal commands, To function as an obedient disciple, professing his faith in the context of a local church community, the new disciple must be baptized, external commands. Not for salvation, but for obedience and to be able to thrive and to live the Christian life. In Acts chapter 8, the order and connection between the two commands, internal and external, appears also in the encounter that Deacon Philip has with the Ethiopian court official. Think about that passage. After following the instructions of the angel of the Lord to go down to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, Philip discovers the Ethiopian reading aloud Isaiah 53. And he goes up to him and he asks, do you you understand what you're reading? And from the top of his chariot, the Ethiopian responds, how can I unless someone guides me and invites Philip to come and sit with him? So they begin to travel together. And we're not given the full context of all that Philip explains, But he proceeds to explain from that scripture, Isaiah 53, that Jesus is the sheep that was led to the slaughter, as it's mentioned in that text. In the account, and Acts relates that Philip, beginning with this scripture, told the Ethiopian of the internal message regarding eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. However, Philip also appears to have communicated some of the external commands as well, thus practicing the Great Commission. For when the Ethiopian's chariot came near some body of water, he says what? See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? 
Philip the deacon is practicing the Great Commission. Isaiah 53, suffering servant, the gospel. You need to repent and believe. But by the way, after you do that, then you need to follow the external commands of Jesus and be baptized. How would the Ethiopian have known of his need for baptism after he confessed in faith in Jesus if Philip had not already taught him of this external command? The baptism of the Ethiopian reinforces the notion that the external commands given in the New Testament, while not primary, are nonetheless important. It should be incorporated properly into any presentation of the good news about Jesus. This is why the habit I've gotten into is whenever I'm asked to give my testimony, first of all, I try to keep it brief. Uh, We can all talk about ourselves far longer than anyone will ever want to hear. But I do intentionally start with how God brought the gospel to my ears and saved me while I was a college student. But I end with how he led me to a local church and was discipled and then received baptism. When someone asks me to give my testimony, I end it with baptism. Not because I think baptism saves, but because I think this is a depiction of what it means to follow and carry out the Great Commission. Yes, I was converted and saved. And by the way, that naturally led me to a local church where I was then discipled and baptized. That is my testimony. That that is our testimony. Thus, so we've seen that throughout the New Testament, the local church functions in this way, not as as a repository, not only to receive and transmit the internal message of the gospel, the Great Commission is given to the church, to the current generation, but also to preserve that gospel message to transmit it to future generations, passing down from grandchildren to children all the way down and also to the ends of the earth. Ambrose of Milan, writing in the fourth century, wrote wrote a book on a meditation on the six days of creation. And he likened in that passage the church to the moon, explaining simply that the church shines brighter by the light of her Savior the way the moon shines brighter because of the light of the sun. Anglican minister, centuries later, John Keeble, took that idea and put it into verse. So, Dr. Beerick, a poem here, uh, just for you. The moon above, the church below, a wondrous race they run. By all their radiance and all their glow, they borrow from the sun. Acts 20.28 instructs believers to do what? Care for the church of God, which Jesus obtained with his own blood. The church, like the moon, is seen and is bright because of the sun. The more the church prioritizes the gospel, the brighter it shines, and the more it points people to Christ. So my decision to live for the church, and what I'm saying today is to prioritize this aspect of gospel first, but church second. There's no reason for believers to be indifferent about the church. The Great Commission prevents us from even thinking that way. Gospel first, church second. Where does the church fit? To live for the church also means not to neglect the external commands for teaching and obeying them as a part of the Great Commission. And by design, helps establish churches that preserve the gospel and shine like the moon because of Christ. So question one, where does the church fit? Like the moon, it shines because of the sun. Question two, and as I said, these are a little more compressed now that we've laid that foundation. Question two, why does the church exist? Quick answer, to serve as a telescope. We've got the moon metaphor now. Shift your thinking to telescope metaphor. Looking now at 1 Timothy 3.15, we see Paul is writing this letter to say, bottom line, if I don't make it to you, this is what you need to know how to live in a local church. That's what he's saying. So in this verse, particularly verse 15, we see Paul give descriptions of the church. He describes it as the household of God. He describes it as the church of the living God. But it's the last description that helps us understand why the church exists. Paul describes the local church as the pillar and buttress of truth. Have you ever noticed that before? He spells it out so clearly here. The church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. This idea of the local church functioning as a pillar and a buttress is intended to create a picture in your mind. It's a picture of an intentionally designed, that is, ordered. An architect put it together. A structure that through its strength has been prepared both to uphold present or proclaim something, it's a pillar and a buttress, as well as protect, preserve something. So it's this intentionally designed, ordered, strong structure that's designed to present or proclaim an object, as well as protect and preserve it, to to keep it out of reach. Jesus' promise in Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, reinforces the idea that the local church has been given as an indestructible fortress of strength 
held together by Jesus Christ himself, Colossians 1, 17. So as a result, Jesus and his apostles have given commands of an external nature that must be taught and implemented. But for what end? Why does the church exist? The object, the object given to the local church to uphold and protect, we see in this verse, is what? The truth. The truth here is the message of eternal life. The substance of the internal commands of Christ. In short, the gospel itself. The pillar and buttress of the gospel. The New Testament teaches that this truth was and is to be handed over or delivered from one generation to the next and to the ends of the earth through the local church. Luke speaks of this at the beginning of his gospel when writing to Thalapha, to assure Theophilus of the certainty of the things which he had been taught. Luke states in Luke chapter 1 that he has written an orderly account of the things that those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word had delivered to Luke and to the other apostles. Likewise, Paul instructs Timothy and the Ephesians church in 2 Timothy to do what? Guard the good deposit, a reference to the entire message of the gospel that he had taught and done what? Delivered it to them. He gave it to them. In a broad sense, the purpose of all of Paul's letters is to deliver the truth, not only to his immediate recipients, but also to all who will read his letters and implement the commands in local churches. We see this in many of his letters, but the end of Colossians 4 explains this clearly. This is what he has in mind. Jude reinforces the notion that the truth is the object the local church exists to proclaim and protect. In Jude 3, he explains that the faith or the gospel message of eternal life, this internal command, has been delivered to who? The saints. That is to say, the internal command of salvation through Jesus Christ has been handed down to Christians who live out the, local, the life of Christ where in local churches. Jude states that his, this delivering was done once for all, referencing the complete and final nature of the message, rather than communicating that the message had no further need of transmission. It's final, it's complete, but it still needs to be proclaimed. And this is why the church exists. Why does the church exist? To receive the gospel message, protect it, and proclaim it. One of C.S. Lewis's friends, Austin Farrer, said this, to be a loyal churchman is hobbyism, unless it's the way to be a loyal Christian. To see through the church to Christ as a man sees through the telescope to the stars. To be a loyal churchman is hobbyism unless it is the way to be a loyal Christian. To see through the church to Christ as a man sees through the telescope to the stars. That is, believers are, are to attend, join, serve, support the local church, not as some sort of cultural hobby or cultural norm, but so the world can see Christ the way a telescope helps you to see the stars. This is why the church exists as a telescope, so that the world can see Christ. The church, the pillar and buttress of truth, exists to guard the good deposit and deliver it to future generations and to the ends of the earth. Question number three, what is the church's purpose? And my brief answer, the church's purpose is to stir like rustling leaves, reminding that someone is coming. When you're out in a forest or on a path, and the wind stirs up the leaves. It could be the wind, but it also could be the sound of someone coming along the path or walking up near you. You can hear the rustling of leaves. What's the church's purpose? To stir like rustling leaves, reminding that someone is coming. So finally, my final answer here to clarify the purpose of the church, it's right to acknowledge that while not the primary emphasis of Scripture, the Bible does affirm the presence of a universal or invisible church. In history, long before Roman Catholicism, believers referred to this as the lowercase c Catholic Church, meaning Catholic meaning universal. So when we recite the Nicene Creed, we say we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And that is okay and good and right to say. We're not saying we believe in the Roman Catholic Church. We say we believe in the biblical universal church. The Baptist faith and message states, the New Testament speaks also of the church as the body of Christ which includes all of the redeemed of all ages, believers from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We see this in biblical phrases like the church of God, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 1, Philippians 3. Paul even refers to himself as persecuting the church of God. And by that we know he's not talking about going down to 5th Street and Straight Street and persecuting that church. He's what? Persecuting a broader collection of individuals, not the organized institution. 
We see this idea of universality in the phrase, the body of Christ, just like the Baptist faith and message points to. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, where Romans 12 is not saying that we're all, all part of the church meeting in Rome, but we being many are part of one larger body. The picture is not of Christ with one head and many bodies, but of Christ with one body, this universal and indivisible church. Yet the predominant emphasis clearly in the New Testament is on the local, visible, organized assembly. And this was carried forward throughout church history, this emphasis, acknowledging universal, but really spending time and attention focusing on the local. As I said early, a minute ago, the early church would summarize their understanding of Bible, biblical teaching of the doctrine of the church by describing the church as one holy, Catholic, universal, and apostolic. And this statement, which was simply a summary of scripture that unified them, gave them a unified understanding of what would be an understanding of what is the church until the Roman Catholic Church added layers of complexity and confusion to this simple and established tradition. So what happened? Well, that's why you have the reformers. They come along and pursued what I call a mere ecclesiology in reaction to this era of Roman complexity. They wanted something simple. They focused on simple notes of the church or marks of the church to define it as true, trying to go back to those early confessions and creeds and to rid all of the tradition and confluation of church and state and power and all these things. John Calvin summarizes in writing in his own era, wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, there it is not to be doubted a church of God exists. One could argue that had the reformers not wrestled with this doctrine of the church to establish a reestablish a mere ecclesiology, the recovery of the solas may not have lasted more than a generation. Sure, the reformers would have recaptured the gospel, but if they haven't pushed forward toward a purified or mere church, would that capture of the gospel have continued to last into our own day? This is the relationship of the value of the church and the gospel and the thing that they hold together. Thankfully, they did, and the gospel did persevere, and all Protestant traditions follow them in this mere ecclesiology even today. This understanding of the marks of the church, Mark Dever simply calls the right preaching of the word and the right administration of baptism in the Lord's Supper. It's the view adopted by Baptist churches from their time of their formal beginnings in 17th century England. It's seen in the First London Confession of Faith in 1644 and the Orthodox Creed of 1679. And by now, you're wondering how many things I'm going to recite off. But listen to this. This definition of the church from Benjamin Keach, a Baptist pastor writing in 1697. A church of Christ, according to gospel institution, is a congregation of godly Christians who, as a stated assembly, being first baptized on profession of faith, do by mutual agreement and consent give themselves up to the Lord and to one another according to the will of God, and do ordinarily meet together in one place for the public service and worship of God, among whom the word of God and sacraments are duly administered according to Christ's institution. That's pretty good. So therefore, as local churches preach the word and carry out baptism in the Lord's Supper, for what end or purpose are they to do this? This is the rustling leaves point. In 1 Peter 4, the Apostle Peter explains that the end of all things is at hand. And by that, he means that he and his readers were living in the last days before the return of Jesus. So since that time, until our very own, this second, this minute, 1044 on uh, this day in January 2023, humanity has been living on the verge of the end of the world. But that is actually, for the believer, not a cause for despair. C.S. Lewis says, all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. So even in this moment, there's rustling of leaves. The pages of the New Testament are rustling like leaves, calling out to the church to remind the world that someone is coming. The purpose of the church is to remind the world that someone is coming. In light of this reality, Peter focused on how one is to live in the last days. And he spends the next few verses in 1 Peter 4 underscoring this for believers. He explains that while a Christian should have his eyes fixed and his hopes set on the soon and certain return of Jesus, he should be using his spiritual gifts, whether they be serving or speaking in the church, all for the glory of God. So as the church is the collection of believers universal and expressed visibly in local assemblies, this then is the, also the grand end or purpose of the church. Until the end, until Christ returns, whether one gives, sins, goes, preaches, or disciples, he or she should be doing these things 
as the biblically prescribed means for carrying out the Great Commission and the glory of God. This is the purpose of the church. One more comment on the Great Commission. I like to think of the Great Commission as actually having within it a great circle, if you will. You can almost draw a diagram of a circle. We've seen the Great Commission is first a call for gospel proclamation. One cannot make a disciple without first seeing them converted. Second, the new believer is baptized and brought into fellowship with the church. This act of baptism and it itself is a depiction of the gospel. It's a depiction of death, burial, and resurrection. It serves as a further proclamation of the gospel. So proclamation of the gospel, baptism, baptism itself goes back to doing what? Proclaiming the gospel. Baptism itself is actually a way of carrying out the Great Commission. There's a circle here. The new believer has taught the remainder after this of Jesus' commands, one of which is to partake in the Lord's Supper, to do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a help. It too proclaims the gospel. As the church meets and partakes of the Lord's Supper, it's doing what? It's proclaiming the gospel, which again, what? Inaugurates the Great Commission. All again, proclamation of the gospel. This circle of the Great Commission continues on throughout the church as it carries out its functions of proclaiming the word, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. The church is sharing the gospel, seeing people converted. The Great Commission is taking place. As the church baptizes new believers, it's also participating in the Great Commission. As the church participates in the Lord's Supper, it is participating in the Great Commission. As the church prays, supports, and sends out others to start new churches, to serve as missionaries around the world, they are carrying out the Great Commission and proclaiming the gospel. And all of it starts the Great Commission over again. And this circle is an unending circle that the church is to continue to repeat until Christ returns. This is the purpose of the church. And in all of this, God is in the midst and is glorified. Sometime during my days as a student, when I sat where you sit, I was um, flying on a plane. And I remember it to this day, oddly enough, I was reading my local church's bylaws. I had a stapled pack of paper. I was reading through the bylaws, just like all of you do um, on, on your own as well, I know. I'd only been a believer for five or six years, and so the idea of a local church, it was all new to me, and I was just captured by it. And uh, my pastor was a phenomenal discipler, and he had introduced me to what would become um, Mark Dever's Nine Marks and taken me to Washington, D.C., and I was just all thinking about the local church. And so I was reading the church's bylaws to understand how it is this church is supposed to work. So while on that flight, working through these details, I was reading and praying, and I remember turning over this packet of paper, I had a pencil, and I just wrote down this. I wrote, I commit faithfully to serve and support the local church in life, practice, study, and vocation. Uh, I was 25 years old, and uh, I was looking at that piece of paper last night, I still have it, and by God's grace, that decision that I made while I sat where you sit changed everything. It influenced so many of decisions, what jobs I would take, what jobs I wouldn't take, where I would serve, where I wouldn't serve, what I would do, what I wouldn't do, how I allot my time working in an institution like this that is sort of on the sidelines seeking to encourage the church. The most important decision I made during the years where I sat while you sit whilst a student was to live for the church, regardless of vocation, regardless of location or specific ministry assignment, and that changed the trajectory, as I say, of everything I do in life. For to live for the church as a believer in Christ is to live for the gospel. I hope you've seen that. To live for the church as a believer in Christ is to live for the nations. You can't help but to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And to live for the church is to live for the glory of God. That's what we're to be doing until he returns. The church is God's home for Christians to live and to thrive until he returns. And I hope you'll make that your priority as well. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and its layers and depths, but also its clarity, helping us with clouded minds and um, hearts in need of sanctification to grasp these higher, wonderful, lofty goals that you have intended for the world until you return. Pray you'd strengthen us and encourage us and help us to keep things simple by focusing on your commission, your commands, and your church Thank you for coming and dying for your church and purchasing it with your blood. We praise you for that here today and this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.